uh, questions uh, if you have them. Um, if you want questions asked of the panelists, please direct those questions either to your breakout room hosts uh, that have the word M in front of their name, or you can send the message to Sujatha or Kylie via chat message. Again, you can rename yourself clicking the three dots in the upper right corner of your image. Closed captioning is available during tonight's program. Just select the up arrow next to live transcript on your screen to toggle subtitles on or off. And as I said, if you just came in, all attendees are on mute in the main room, but you will be able to take yourself off mute in the breakout rooms. You can change your screen view, which is important because we're gonna using the highlight button at different times to highlight our speakers. There is a view button on the top of your Zoom tab, which enables you to toggle between different view settings. And if you need any additional assistance while in the breakout rooms, there is an ask for help invite host button at the bottom of your screen when you're in the breakouts and one of our facilitators will join you in your breakout room. Now housing and specifically home ownership are benchmarks of the American dream and they're tied to a host of other things that we care deeply about. Schools, safety, traffic, access to services, and so much more. Homes also represent the chief investment strategy for a good portion of the American public. And as a result, conversations about housing and the vision of our communities can be emotionally charged and polarizing. But that's not what tonight is about. Tonight is about learning and dialogue with each other and with our panelists. At West Valley Community Services, we seek to bring people together as one to address some of our most pressing social issues. With that spirit in mind, and in order to ensure a safe space for all of us to participate, we're gonna ask us all to follow these community agreements this evening. Use I statements, step up and step back. So if you're a person who talks a lot, maybe step back a little bit. But if you're a person who doesn't speak very often, I'd encourage you to engage in conversation in your breakout rooms. What's said here stays here, what's learned here leaves here. So we don't wanna attribute things necessarily to what someone said, but if we learn things tonight, we should share those learnings with the folks in our circles. We wanna assume best intentions and, and listen and not interrupt folks when they're chatting. It's okay to disagree, but we can do that respectfully. We wanna engage in conflict resolution in a constructive way. And we wanna respect everyone's differences knowing we come at this issue from different ideas and different perspectives. And we wanna uplift each other and check in on each other. So hopefully, maybe if I can see a show of thumbs, are we all good tonight to show up in this way to support this community conversation? I gotta take this off share so I can see all those thumbs. Those are a lot of thumbs. Thank you for all your thumbs, y'all. And thank you for being here tonight. So we're gonna start tonight's program with some level setting around the housing element. And to do that, it is my pleasure to turn the mic over to J.R. Fruin, Cupertino for All Policy Director. Now, J.R. is going to take himself off mute in a second. If you want to ask questions uh, of J.R., please send those questions to Sujatha or Kylie, and we will pose those to J.R. either right after he's done with his presentation or after the panel presentation. Take it away, J.R. Thank you so much, Josh. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everybody for coming tonight. So I'm gonna to try to give you a crash course in what the, hell, the uh, housing element is and what um, you can do to try to engage on it and why this all matters. So what exactly is the housing element? Um, basically, it's part of a city's general plan. Every city in the state of California is required by law to have a general plan. Its purpose is to foster the orderly growth of a city. Um, that general plan consists of multiple elements and the housing element is one such element. At the end of the day, the housing element is special in the sense that it has to be certified by a particular state entity. That's the California Department of Housing and Community Development, which you'll see in these slides going forward as HCD. So why does this matter? Well, all of these policies become local law. Um, that law is going to determine the shape and the character of the homes and the built environment of the city. So it's going to strongly influence how the city looks when you walk around, when you drive through it. Um, it will influence the type uh, of levels of affordability of the homes that are in that city. And therefore also who's likely to be able to live here and why. And then we'll get to the very end of the discussion. There are some legal consequences if we can't get uh, 
HCD to certify our housing element and will be very important. And they'll be important no matter how you feel about adding more homes to the city of Cupertino. All of this is part of a much larger process. Cupertino is not the only city going through this. It's not even in the only region that's going through this, this process. This is a, a thing that is done all throughout the state on a staggered basis. Our area where we are, um, it's known as ABAG, you can forget that term going forward, uh, is a nine county planning region in the Bay Area. And we are at this particular stage of, of setting up what we want in the housing element. We're at the very beginning of it. Like I said, it's a legally mandated planning process. Um, the major component of that is that every city has to plan to meet a certain population growth threshold at every income level. So you are trying to match um, the expected population growth in your city and the different levels of affordability that are expected amongst those newcomers to your city um, with the housing that is available there. It's a minimum planning requirement. So this is not a goal. Sometimes it's referred to that way. It's not, it is a minimum planning requirement. Um, and the process isn't new. This has been around for a long time. The very first housing element law actually comes to us from the late sixties, which is the time period when housing start, started to drop off in the state of California. It has been reinforced multiple times over the years, and there's a whole lot of recent legislation that's been passed because the legislature has realized that that set of policies hasn't really been working very well for the last four decades. Um, and as I said, it's a regional planning uh, arrangement. We are not the only city going through this. And, and if anybody is wondering, you see, see, you hear this girl named Rena all the time in these, these policy discussions, it stands for Regional Housing Needs Assessment alternatively reg regional housing needs allocation depending upon the context. Um, so it's not that you're missing out on meeting somebody. She, she's not a real person, but she is a real policy. And like I said, the fundamental issue here is planning for affordability. Um, it is written into the government code that every city is supposed to be planning for housing at all income levels. So this is a, a legislative mandate. It is not an option. Um, those income levels are keyed to a thing called area median income. Area median income is obviously the most common uh, midpoint of uh, um, incomes in a particular area. Uh, that, that particular number is used to control for things like extraordinarily high wealth individuals or extraordinarily low wealth individuals. Uh, it's a county level statistic, so it does not vary from city to city. It does, however, vary from county to county. So AMI in Santa Clara County is different from AMI in San Mateo County, et cetera. Um, there are four recognized income levels that are set per the health and safety code. They are above moderate income. That's 120% or more of AMI. Sometimes this is referred to as market rate uh, affordability. They're not exactly the same thing, so be careful with those terms. Uh, moderate income, that's 80 to 120% of area median income. Low income, 50 to 80%. Very low income, those are folks who make less than 50% of area median income. And these numbers are all keyed also to the size of the household. So it's not just that it's one person making this necessarily, it is the size of the household that matters. So that number, the, the actual income level will vary depending upon the size of the household. Um, the premise of all affordability, again, per the Health and Safety Code, is that no individuals should not be paying more than 30% of their gross income on housing costs. So what is affordable housing then? Well, there's sort of two types. Um, the first type is basically housing that's going to be affordable to you, just as it is. So that's you know, the point at which the supply uh, of housing matches market demand at all uh, existing income levels. Sometimes we refer to this as naturally affordable housing. It's typically older housing stock that's filtered down over time. It can also be smaller homes. Um, when it comes to uh, state documents, for example, accessory dwelling units, sometimes, sometimes called granny flats um, or in-law units, these are generally speaking able to be qualified as moderate income units because of their size and their marketability. The second type of affordable housing is the thing that we will tend to think of in capitalized A, capitalized H, uh, affordable housing. Um, that is deed restricted below market rate housing. So these are all homes that have an actual covenanted restriction in the deed 
restricting the rent or the purchase price uh, of the homes to specific levels of affordability. Um, they're administered uh, based upon the eligibility criteria uh, that you'll see later in a chart, and they're generally weighted um, on a lottery basis. So that weight can include, for example, people who already live in a particular jurisdiction getting a, a leg up, people who work for uh, a local school district or another local government agency also getting a, a, a leg up so that folks like firefighters and teachers have a stronger chance at, at winning the affordable housing lottery. Um, and all of them require some kind of financial subsidy. That could be impact fees from new development, it could be competitive grant sources, inclusionary set-aside ordinances, um, bond and other types of public money. I will give you the special note though that, that sometimes the last of these is, is somewhat difficult if only because spending public money on um, low-income housing, generally speaking, requires a, uh, a public vote per Article 34 of the California Constitution. So I'm gonna give you a hypothetical and we'll see how everybody does here. Sujatha, if you'd like to begin the first question for the poll. So Angie's been teaching at Monta Vista High School for a couple of years. She's straight out of undergrad. Her spouse, Danny, is a graduate student at Stanford and works as a research associate at the university. Combined, they make $87,000. Do Angie and Danny qualify for affordable housing? about three more seconds here to pick an answer. Most of you's answered so far. All right, I'm going to end that poll. So most of you got this correct. Yes, they do. Not only do they qualify, they qualify for low-income housing. Um, they would fall into the category of uh, two individuals um, making uh, less than $94,000 a year. So they, they would definitely qualify. That's rather significant. Um, and again, this is for the FUHSD. Um, I will tell you that Cupertino Union School District has an even lower pay schedule. A typical teacher similarly situated would have been making about 60 some odd thousand dollars, um, they might actually fall into the very low income category at that point. And then you'd have to ask yourself what kind of rents are available um, to a couple in this situation. Rent Cafe says that uh, Cupertino's average rent right now for a, a roughly 900 square foot uh, one to two bedroom home is $3,000 a month. So is that a third of their income? No, that's a lot more than a third of their income. So there's, there's gonna be precious few homes that are available to them. It means that they're probably gonna to have to commute. Again, here's the pay schedule for Fremont Union High School. So you can see where they would sit somewhere in here. So given that, um, and that this is not a problem unique to Cupertino or our area, um, this process over time has generally speaking not worked in California. Why has it not worked? Well, because the cities that, or I should say the, the number of homes that have been planned for in various cities um, have not been built uh, for various reasons. So cities have had a really, really hard time meeting their minim minimums. And the legislature over time has realized that we need to do more in order to resolve that issue. Um, and while experts will disagree on the exact level of the, the housing supply shortfall in California, we do rank number 49 out of 50 in the number of homes per capita uh, in the United States. That's a pretty low score. <laughs> uh, California presently averages about uh, 358 homes per every 1,000 residents. And over the last 40 years, we've actually been building fewer than that number of homes, meaning that we're actually worsening that situation and have been for four decades. And to give you some context here, you know, as, as population increases in the state, it also increases um, locally. Of the three FUHSD schools in Cupertino, we graduated 1,600 students in 2020, but Cupertino only permitted 20 new homes. 
that's not just a, an issue for that one year. We've generally speaking only been building uh, close to that during the course of the entire eight year cycle. So we've, we've permitted 328 homes so far during the current arena cycle. This time around, things get a lot more serious. Um, like I said, the legislature realized that uh, um, we haven't actually been meeting the, the present needs. Um, most of the prior forms were uh, sort of aspirational. Cities were able to, to argue that they had stable housing, so they weren't gonna get a higher allocation. And allocations and appeals tended to reflect sort of the political um, importance of individual cities and their relative wealth. And perhaps the most standout example of that is that Beverly Hills was given an allocation of only three units in this last cycle. So they only had to produce three new homes. I can guarantee you that there are a lot of people who work in Beverly Hills. I'm sure that there are some folks who've been to Rodeo Drive and three units of, of housing is not going to house everybody who works on that street. Um, the key piece of new legislation that really changes the game here is SB 828. Um, from 2018, it, uh, it changes the way that, that RENA is arranged in each region. It establishes some clear and much less political standards. Um, it intends to combat household overcrowding by pegging the standard to a 5% ideal vacancy rate. Um, the intention is to reduce the number of cost burdened households. So analyzing that statistic makes a lot of uh, difference. There's a, a particular focus on the jobs housing fit. That's the number of homes that are affordable to people who are making low income uh, wages. So it's a principle of equity. This is a, a spot where Cupertino scores unfortunately very poorly. Um, within the nine county ABAG planning region, uh, we score at about 14 to one, only Danville is close to us on that number. Um, and the other last piece of this is a sort of harmonization with the rest of California's climate goals by reducing vehicle miles traveled, uh, typically um, just car use. So um, we'll move on to our, our next question here. I, I'm, you know, a, within the, the nine uh, county planning region in the last cycle, we had to plan for roughly 180,000 new homes. Um, Cupertino share was 1064. So under all of these new methodologies, what do you think uh, Cupertino now has to plan to facilitate? Sujatha, if you want to start the next poll. In the interest of time, I'm going to cut this once we get 50 respondents. And so 38% of you are correct. 400, I'm sorry, 4,588 new homes is what Cupertino has to plan for. Overall, um, the uh, the state has passed a host of other new laws so that this planning process is more equitable. Um, again, Cupertino has to plan at all income levels uh, for the new housing. That, that means it's not just, you know, 4,588 new market rate homes. It's distributed across a number of different income categories. Um, but in addition, the city has to identify and remove constraints to residential development to make sure that the plan is actually buildable. There's a legal requirement to zone for sufficient densities that's going to vary depending upon where you are. In Cupertino, that'll be about 30 homes per acre in certain places. The city will also have to provide evidence that its plan is feasible, especially for sites that are not presently vacant and are currently in use. So you can't just replace a strip mall without demonstrating that it's going to be replaced with new housing. And the city has to affirmatively further fair housing, meaning they can't just put all of the housing in one spot. It has to give sort of equal access to opportunity in different parts of the city. Uh, and there's also a, a, a planning uh, and outreach mandate that says that uh, the city has to reach out to folks who ordinarily wouldn't participate in this process or who are underrepresented, renters, youth, seniors, et cetera. So with that, what percentage of Cupertino do you think is made up of renters?
Okay. So the correct answer was 39, 39%. Yeah, so you guys are close, but, uh, but yes, it's a, it's a substantial uh, segment of the population. It's probably larger than most people would, would be expecting considering uh, the, the tendency for people to own their own homes in single family neighborhoods. Most of Cupertino is zoned for single family use. So why, why do all of this? What is the reason for it? Um, what would, what would, what's helped by all of uh, this planning? Uh, well, if we do a good housing element, uh, then we can ensure that housing is actually more affordable. So remember all of those high school students who hopefully want to come back, contribute to their communities that they've lived in. They have a, a shot at it. Folks who uh, serve the community, whether they're teaching kids in school or putting out fires or prepping your, your coffee at Starbucks, um, they'd have a better shot. It expands our tax base. New um, development is going to be taxed at present assessment. It will provide new impact fees on new development and community benefits that benefits schools, it benefits the city and, and all the services it provides. We would replace inefficient, older, carbon intensive buildings. We'll reduce our carbon footprint that way. Uh, things like our new reach code would actually be effective because we replace the older buildings with new ones. We can reduce vehicle miles traveled by you know, building new homes that are closer to the job centers that are here in Cupertino. And we have the shot at, at creating a more integrated and, and equitable community. Um, you'll notice that um, per the, uh, the Othering and Belonging Institute attached to UC Berkeley, Cupertino is rated as having a very high level of segregation and um, significantly lower numbers of Latino and uh, uh, Black population relative to the rest of the area. Now, what if we don't get it right? Um, well, there are some very serious consequences this time if we don't. Um, in particular, a significant degree of loss of local control. So um, everyone here I'm sure is familiar with SB 35. There's a, a significant project that will remain nameless here um, that uh, um, was approved pursuant to SB 35. There are two versions of that. There is a light touch version that allows you to put forward a project with a smaller amount of affordable housing. That version would apply if you don't have a state certified housing element. Also, there is a, a pro housing default rule built into the Housing Accountability Act that would allow any developer to propose a project uh, for housing of any density, even on land zone for single family use um, anywhere in the city. Uh, that's, I think, something if, if you care about the, um, the shape of the city and where things go, um, that that would matter to you. It also opens up the city to all kinds of legal action, fines, um, and to the potential that instead of our community helping to draft the housing element, that it would be created instead by a judge in court. Will we be able to build it this time? Well, the legislature passed a whole host of new laws in order to help make that happen. I'm not gonna labor uh, over all of them here. The panelists can address uh, what they are, how they work, um, but there's a whole bunch of them. Suffice it to say the legislature has been very, very active. And one would hope also that all of these, uh, uh, you know, the consequences of not getting it right would, would be a good reason for cities to help create more incentives to build. If you have questions, simply send them to Neil. You can also drop them into the, the chat to our panelists, uh, not to our panelists, to our facilitators here. And I'll be happy to answer them, hopefully live today. If I don't get to it at the end of, of this session, then I will happily reach out to you afterward. Um, we'll also have a forthcoming list on our website of reference sources and other help, uh, helpful links to literature that can help you get involved in the process, feel comfortable with it, know how to, how to be engaged. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, JR. That, there's so much information there uh, that just 10 minutes of, uh, of that presentation is, is, is clearly not enough. Um, so we are going to break out into breakout rooms. And actually, JR, you can stop sharing your screen. Uh, we're done with that part right there. Uh, we're gonna break you down into breakout rooms now um, because we wanna give you a space to process that information. You will each have a moderator in your room. They have a letter M in front of their name. And, uh, but in case something happens and you end up in a room without a moderator, hopefully someone will step forward to play that moderator role. And here are some questions we'd like you to discuss in your breakout rooms. Your name and what brings you here tonight. 
What are your hopes and concerns around housing in Cupertino? And what questions do you want to ask the panelists? And Kylie, just drop those into the chat so they'll follow you into your room. You'll have 10 minutes and we'll see you back here in 10. A powerful. <laughs> the affordability conversation is so powerful because of the, the really amazing creativity, energy, and um, ideas, um, life that comes in when you have a broad spectrum of affordability. So often you hear about the problems that come with that, but the reality is, in my experience, that as you actually make visible and pull people in, that the communities become incredibly vibrant. And so for me, the affordability component is bringing that in. It's not staying static. It's bringing in new life. And really, uh, it's it, even people's kids, you know, their kids can't afford to live here anymore. Uh, a lot of seniors are not able to live live here anymore affordably. So I think that the conversation is, do we actually want a vibrant community? And that's the affordability piece that I would, I would point out. Thanks there. Other folks wanna comment on affordability and inclusivity. I would just say that you can't really have uh, a truly inclusive community without affordability because, you know, as JR sort of pointed out, the people that can't afford to live in Cupertino right now are the people that um, provide vital services to the city. There are teachers, there are firefighters, there are um, service providers. And um, so this question of, you know, affordability and inclusivity, like you cannot have one without the other. Other folks, I have other questions, but happy to keep the floor open for other folks who want to weigh in. Um, I can jump in. I'm, I'm Nadia. I'm at the Law Foundation, which we provide free legal services in housing. And I'm also like, I'm from Cupertino. I still live here at my parents' house because that's what I can afford. But, um, <laughs> you know, like study after study has shown that, um, that if people are able to move into higher opportunity areas, there's better, their lives are better. Like they're better educated, they're healthier, um, they have access to better food. Um, your life, or your life is just better. And as a community, like we know that community is better when we have like access to to diversity when when people are exposed to different things. So, I think it, I mean this is going to sound a little bit kumbaya, but like if we're if we want a better world, and if we want to live in a in a vibrant community, it has to be one where um, where that's affordable and inclusive for everyone. Awesome, thank you. I want to pivot. We had a few questions uh, from people who expressed, um, you know, what do you say to Cupertino residents who are worried about the impact of denser or more affordable housing, things like congestion, fear of crime, uh, lowering house values? How do you respond to these these very real fears that people have? Uh, Assembly Member Lowe, uh, are you good to start off on that question? Of course, Josh. Well, uh, thanks so very much for helping to convene an opportunity to have dialogue with our community. And it's exactly that, to hear from Vera's perspective of our community as well and holding our government officials like myself accountable to the community. Um, and addressing the first question and the second question is also representation. And that's when we also say how important it is to have representation in all areas of government. And that's what we're also trying to do to reimagine as we talk about the issue of housing, that we must reimagine previous generations, perhaps my grandparents and my family members who believed and envisioned in the American dream of being a single family home, large lots, white picket fence. Whereas you fast forward today, we must reimagine how we look to secure the right to housing. And of course, these are valid fears about changing the makeup or the suburban integrity of a specific community. At the same time, we also must recognize the policy changes that must also occur to addressing this crisis. And that's exactly what this is. And by the way, uh, this is well known and well documented. So how do we ensure that we're using the right public policy to help address and alleviate these concerns uh, 
these, these real fears, but frankly, much of the fear, if we take a step back and we look about, think about the history of redlining and housing and the discriminatory practices that exist from this, then we'll start to realize hmm, there's something to this argument. So I think history is very important for us to remember, but I just encourage us also to think about the specifics around ensuring that we are fundamentally focused on the values of the right to housing. And sometimes that requires us to sacrifice of our our own to help support those others. And that's why it breaks my heart when I'm hearing from community college students going to De Anza Community College and talking about them living in their own cars, Google engineers living in their own vehicles. This is the most vibrant, more venture capital than any other region in the world. And that also requires us to support the infrastructure that exists to support the incredible talent that we have here. But we need to do it together. Thank you, Assembly Member Lowe. I, I'd love to uh, chime in on that question as well, like from a very practical standpoint. So one affordable housing to be funded needs to be near amenities and things like that. And the standards to which you're held to build affordable housing is actually really high. Um, we're held to much higher standards than many market rate developers. Um, there are uh, environmental concerns uh, that we address that market rate developers don't are don't have to. We are doing when we're looking at building in a community. There's a community engagement process. We're talking to the community. We're um, we have to do impact studies. So we're looking at you know what additional traffic congestion and those sorts of things that will be caused by the development uh, itself um, and. The tenancy that goes into affordable housing goes through an immense screening process. You can ask anyone who lives in affordable housing, they and they have to recertify every year. So they have to say who's living in their house, how much they make, and the amount of information that they have to share about themselves is far and above <laughs> what uh, a typical uh, person going to rent an apartment has to share about themselves or their family makeup. And so I would say, you know, that I understand those fears, but um, the reality is, you know, they're sort of unfounded, like that these, these are people just like you and me and they, they're required to share a lot more about themselves just to get housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think for me, another connected question to this, and I want to build off of what you were saying, Bianca, what are some misconceptions folks have about affordable housing? Um, does anyone want to jump in and start with that? I can jump in. Uh, Thanks. And then hand it off to Nadia. I see she was ready to jump in as well. Um, you know, it, it, the, the mis- I think that the primary misconception is that these are that 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 homes are somehow built for people that we don't know, um, and the the truth is that for the most part, that the folks who end up living in affordable housing in our communities are already members of our communities. They work here. They grew up here. Um, they're you know they're they're a part of of who we are it's just that right now they can't afford to live here and be a part um, of the community um i i thought that um mayor's comment about sort of bringing the creativity and the energy out uh and and forward was really valuable the benefits of having a place to live that you can afford uh, rather than struggling every month to figure out how to keep afloat is tremendous. And the amount of energy that can be unleashed uh, through that, the amount of, um, you know, just a, a regional, uh, additional resources that can be brought to a community uh, with, with affordable housing options is really tremendous. So I, I think that the primary misconception is that this is somehow going to be anything other than an asset um, to a community in terms of, of creating opportunity for folks that are here. Nadia, did you want to add to that? 
Um, the only thing I think Matthew said it right. I mean, the only thing I would add is that there, there there's a lot of stereotypes around crime and affordable housing, um, but the statistics actually, you know, actually are the opposite. And there was a study I recently saw, I think, out of Philadelphia, which shows that the more people are stably housed, the less crime exists. And so. Um, like a lot of the stereotypes that exist around affordable housing and people who are unhoused are just that, they're just stereotypes. Um, and really, um, I just wanna just, you know, start what Matthew said, like this is about um, in ensuring that everyone in our, in our community is, sta is stable and so that they're able to really live and thrive. Awesome. Thank you, Nadia. Mayor, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just jump in real shortly. I work with people who live in their cars and I also live in below market rate housing. So I can speak directly to this. Uh, definitely one of the biggest misconceptions with people that live in their cars is that they are not us. And what's fascinating about it is it really will freak you out when you start interacting with them, number one, to realize that they are you. They are you. They have had a slip and things have gone sideways and they cannot get back up without money. It's not a subtle thing. There's not any way for them to go. And it's regular old people. It's like everything that you could imagine. So I think that um, that's a huge misconception that these are not us, but also that idea that in the safe parking community, in the communities of the below market rate, in a lot of the communities that I'm in, they are so much on the other side of taking care of their people. They actually do a lot of their own capabilities. They protect the people around them very extremely. They have a real sense of ownership that a lot of people in a more stable situations do not. They want to be invisible. They do not want to be highly attention seeking. So we need to get a little bit clearer that the reality is that they do increase the safety in the community because they are very aware of the situation. They have to be, that's how they survive. Abdullah, did you want to jump in? Yeah, hi. So my name is Abdullah. I'm a high school student, and I agree with everybody and the points I made. And just building up upon that, uh, as a person who lives in low income and who's from a low income family and who lives in a community with other people of low income and socio socioeconomically disadvantaged family, I think a lot of residents could and community members could have misconceptions about us. And though I may not know every misconception, I do know what our community is like. And the community that I know, the people who live in affordable housing are many times immigrants, people of color, um, people who uh, have who, who work hard for their families and who work hard um, for the community that they love. But they just might be system systematically disadvantaged or like Mira said, uh, may just have a slip. Um, and I know from personal experience, my neighbors, for example, they're from every part of the wor world, from Latin America to Africa to Asia, uh, and they have children in our schools and they care about the city. Um, so I think that's sort of been a huge misconception. And I also think many times residents think that they have to give something up in order to create affordable housing, like safety or like good schools. But I think that the truth is nothing but farther from that. Um, and I know that from personal experience. So I think when we build more affordable housing, we're going to build a more vibe, vibrant, diverse, and stronger Cupertino. Awesome. Thanks, Abdallah. That was very, uh, very well put. I want to ask about the, about the community's role in raising their voice in support of housing. And I want to direct this to folks on the panel who've done organizing work, or like you, Assemblymember Lowe, who's involved in um, crafting legislation on behalf of your constituents. What roles can just community members like us play in this process? How do we how do we connect? How do we make our voice heard? What are the best ways to do that? Thanks, Josh. Well, I think uh, well certainly we're doing it right now. It's really how do we get beyond the eighty four participants that we have on the Zoom uh, and and getting them to also engage. 
uh, but not only just getting specific policy changes from our elected representatives, but engaging with other state key stakeholders that also have a role to play in this, including that of private businesses and corporations too, who also need to ensure that they have the housed workforce uh, in part of this conversation. And this is the community that we're living in. So I think that's a multi-pronged approach, but certainly going out and making it well known by asking elected officials about their positions and to also sit down with them to best understand the process because the fact of the matter is frankly there's a lot of democracy in California and much of it can be blurred in terms of is it a local is it a local city council measure or is it a direct initiative at the city level or is it a statewide and or regional level as well I don't know, Matthew or Nadia or, or Mayor, if you can provide some context into the organizing work you've done. Matthew, do you want to jump in? Sure. You know, the, the critical thing is that there are there are rules that we're working under right now, but there's also a tremendous room and really important space for the community to be involved in figuring out how those within those rules, um, you know, planning can happen in a city like Cupertino that really best meets the city's needs. I think we're in a moment at which folks are throwing their hands up and saying, oh, they're making all the decisions for us. Well, the truth is that they're not. Um, there's, there's clear guidance, but there's real opportunity for, uh, for folks to, to plug in and be involved. And that's what's going to make this a successful process. Um, so I, I'm, you know, part of it is just explaining what, 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 you know, this discussion has been about of how do we respond to the challenges that we face. But I think it's people, people also need to realize that this is where their voice comes in. This is how they shape uh, their communities is by participating and, and our expectations that will bring people into the process. Some of the concerns that I have heard related to affordable housing or the development of more dense housing are around things like access to public works, like water, electricity. You often hear questions about you know, transportation, what's gonna happen on the roads. And then of course, for those of us who've been reading, we know that there's a real threat of school closures in, in, um, in Cupertino. So how do we respond? I mean, how do we prepare for the, this housing? How is our infrastructure gonna support more folks living in the city? And anyone who wants to jump in and, and address that question, please do. Um, that, those, those are concerns, but I mean, it's not like people, it's not like people aren't, don't exist. I mean, we, we know that there's people who are unhoused, like we see encampments all the time. So, I mean, like, and we know like the, we know that it is much cheaper to house someone then all of the services connected to being unhoused, right? Whether that's shelter or, you know, like policing or, you know, all the other things that come with, with being, um, being unhoused. And so I think we got to take like a big picture bird's eye view of, of, of this, this conversation and like, cause there's always going to be a cost benefit. Um, and like really right now, the cost to our community, I mean, like I see it every day with our clients, the law foundation, like, we have clients who like, you know, they're facing eviction and, you know, their next step is an RV. You know, we have people who are getting kicked out of RVs. Their next step is a car or like an encampment. So, I mean, it's not, I mean, we're, we're already living with the consequences of not doing enough. Um, and on the infrastructure piece, like we know, like we know, yes, there are environmental concerns, but we know that there, it, it's much more um, environmentally friendly to, it, you know, it's like a multifamily bu building uses less water per capita than um, than a single family home. Um, and like Assembly Member Lowe said, like we just have to kind of rethink and reimagine what what we think about when we think about the American dream. And then Josh, the only thing I want to just share an observation is that um, we need to have an intellectually honest conversation about a specific policy, which is to say that oftentimes I'll hear the argument that, yes, we support affordable housing, but why don't you build it over there, just not in my backyard. Um, and with respect to 
Cupertino schools and the closures. Uh, yeah, we support schools, but we don't want to pay for it. And that's what we've seen here, that the vast majority of the electorate says we do not want to pay, but yet you don't want good quality schools in our communities. So we can't have it both ways. We need to have frank conversations about what we hope to see, what are our value statement, and also being able to pay for the service that we receive, being able to support the policy position to see the end result. We can't have it both ways. So let's have frank and honest conversations about this in a democratic way but be intellectually honest as well, it's being supported by the data points that we are using our arguments on too. But this requires us all to get out of our comfort zones and also seek the dialogue with those that might not necessarily think similarly from us, from different generations, uh, different socioeconomic backgrounds as well. And that's what this conversation is about. Awesome. I think that's a good point. We have to be able to engage with people who may not 100% agree with us if we're going to find a solution to this this big problem. Abdullah, I want to draw you in also, what are high school students talking about as it relates to affordable housing? Are there concerns about where they're going to live when they grow up and come back? I mean, what kinds of things are you and your peers talking about? Yeah, so I definitely think that there's a lot of concern about whether we can live here in the future. But at the same time, there's not a lot of conversations about building more affordable housing and the housing element process. And I think overall, we've just sort of been, I guess, we sort of feel ignored in this conversation a lot of times. So I think we sort of need to change the way we have this conversation to communicate with high schoolers and to reach out with them. And I think the way we can do that is by showing high schoolers how multifaceted this issue is and to explain to them that a, the housing crisis and the housing issue is not just like a zoning issue, but it's also a racial issue. It's a economic issue. It's an environmental issue. And once we start including these um, sort of topics that young people are passionate about, we can include more of them would be passionate about housing as well. And they can be included in this conversation. And I think other than that, there's so many different ways we can start reaching out to young people, whether that be, you know, going to their schools or like using social media. So we can sort of attract them to this conversation and have them, um, you know, be passionate about this issue as well, because we're still really passionate about a lot of other issues. We just don't know about this one right now. Uh, awesome. I think um, one of the challenges that I find, and I have not been a high school student for many years, is that they're complicated issues also with lots of laws and intricacies, and it's hard to sort of navigate. But I, I think it is something that we all have to care about, especially young people who want to come back li and live in the communities in which they grew up, but will struggle to afford to live here um, as prices continue to increase. I want to just let the attendees know your questions have been awesome. We, we still have time for a few more. I've been asking them and sometimes bringing several questions together since you all had such great questions. We won't have time for all of them, um, but if you still have questions, do feel free to send them in to Kylie and Sujatha and our moderators also drop them in. We did get a couple questions from folks. Um, how can the faith community, or is there a particular role the faith community can play in the housing element process or in the conversation around affordable housing? The faith community is the biggest holder of surplus land <laughs> in the entire state of California. So um, there's a lot of power to be wielded there. Um, and so, you know, I work for an affordable housing developer and, you know, we've uh, formed partnerships with uh, churches to develop affordable housing. And so that's certainly one avenue, um, as well as just being advocates. Um, I'll jump in. Uh, the thing that I see is that um, it, it, it's very specific sets of, of outreach but it's also the one-to-one -one conversations become very, very powerful. It's one far and away the least used method. We've become a little bit not as good at um, relational kind of one-to-one uh, -one conversational ways of communicating and educating and, and including. So faith communities uh, using those strengths is very powerful. You also have a lot of communities doing very specific outreach, uh, the safe parking programs, the, the uh, programs of uh, um, immigration. Uh, you, you have the youth programs that allow them to learn and integrate into some of these experiences, the seniors 
having their own um, contributions to those conversations, it's become a really powerful way to have that interaction. And also, I will point out that the interfaith communication has become one of the most powerful things I've ever seen in my life. The interfaith conversations because of the differences and needing to navigate them has taught me personally more about community care than any other way that I've learned. It's very, very powerful, very personal. So I really appreciate that aspect of it. Thank you, Mayor. We had a few questions related to where would we build more housing in a crowded, uh, a crowded city or a crowded bay. So folks, where, where can you see this additional housing or higher density housing go? I'm gonna ask that we not refer to specific projects that are in development already, but just maybe areas you think where there's opportunity for development. <laughs> Mayor's very interested in hearing this. <laughs> I can jump in. Um, the answer is everywhere and um, different types of new opportunities will fit better in different places. So, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we started building uh, small rental units or family units in backyards, accessory dwelling units. That has increased housing opportunity in cities throughout the region, but it's a very particular need that it responds to. Uh, the state has recently passed SB 9, uh, which says that we can redevelop uh, single family lots uh, with multiple units. Um, we think that's very important because it's going to be at a scale that's responsive to the communities. There are other places in which we need to build higher density housing. Um, it's very important in this process, actually, that we think about how to plan where that housing should go. Um, part of the concern about traffic is that people are separated from the things that they need every day, and so they have to get in their car. So this is an opportunity to think about how to bring housing into mixed use spaces that already include retail, commercial, schools, places of worship, the things that we use in our lives, that's where we need to put housing. And that's how we address, frankly, makes our lives better. <laughs> and it addresses some of the concerns about traffic and it helps us, it helps to guide us to figure out where that housing needs to go. So the answer is everywhere. And then the answer is that different types of housing are going to work best in different places. And we really need to commit to recognizing, as the assembly member said, that you know, we are changing as a region. We are becoming more, more urban. And there's ways of sustaining the qualities of our communities that are important to us while we do that. And participating in this discussion um, is a really critical step in that process. So I know Assemblymember Lowe referenced redlining, but I think um, it would be it would be good for us to get a little bit of a very short but greater understanding of how did we get here. And it's not just a challenge Cupertino's having. The Bay Area and many large urban centers throughout the United States are having this problem, not enough housing. So can someone maybe give the short story version of how we ended up in the situation we're in right now? And I know it's tall order, I know. Y'all are so kind to each other. You're like, well, someone else is gonna go first. <laughs> go ahead, Bianca. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we have in this country a history of racism, surprise, surprise. And um, single family zoning is a big part of that. And we talked about SB9 here, which um, sort of does away with this idea of single family zoning. And single family zoning was really a way to uh, keep the other out of communities. Um, and uh, with it came this idea of redlining. So there were actual banks that drew red lines and there were areas where they would not lend to individuals. And so it kept communities of color um, in certain areas. And so that is like the very like short, short uh, uh, synopsis. And, and and thank you. I, I think we all want to be respectful because each of us has some 
uh, something to offer in this dialogue and conversation uh, to also learn from each other. But I mean, you nailed it on the head, which is that of, I think we're also at a point in time in which we are taking a look at a wide variety of different policies in the state of California to rectify the wrongs of the past, if it's with respect to housing, employment, access to healthcare, education, policing, uh, affordable housing, drinking water, everything, all the above. Uh, this is about the, the social justice and the equity that we're seeing in the state of California and abroad and everything of course is intertwined, but it requires us to not forget our history. And that's why history is so incredibly important so that we can recognize how we got here. And then also making sure that we address and acknowledge some of the inequities that exist to be able to correct them. Otherwise, we're looking at this like a clean slate and it's not, and we must recognize that. And by the way, when we're talking about some of the issues impacting Cupertino, my role is also at a statewide and a regional level. We're seeing this all throughout the entire state of California. So I think it's important for us to recognize that we do have a role to play in Silicon Valley and helping to support fellow Californians in this entire state as well. Thank you so much. Well, time is running very short. I want to ask two more uh, questions and then we'll probably have to drive uh, dry our drive our panel to a close, but I could spend all night listening to the six of you. So thank you so much. You know, we're seeing a labor shortage right now in our community and, and probably outside of our community as well. Um, is there any connection between the labor shortage we're seeing and the housing crisis in our community? And are there opportunities for labor and housing folks to work together to, you know, to, to create a more inclusive housing community? I'm seeing a lot of nods. So I want to take that one. Yeah, I can jump in real quickly. I think the real and and JR mentioned this in his uh, in his opening. The reality is that a, a lot of people who work in Cupertino can't afford to live in Cupertino, and the the other reality is that uh, life is hard when that happens. And I think we're coming out of the pandemic and people are, are making choices. Some people have already moved away. Um, and so lower wage jobs are really, it's a challenge to find folks who are willing to travel long distances to come in and work for what is essentially not a living wage. Um, and that's not gonna go away until we, we respond to it. Um, in terms of labor and sort of capital L labor, <laughs> Uh, and the labor movement and, and the movement of, of uh, working people in the state. Um, labor has always been a very, very strong supporter of the needs for housing and affordable housing. Um, the folks that are organized in, in the labor movement tend to be lower wage or middle wage families that are frankly getting, getting killed right now. Um, in California. And so it's not only a need of the community, um, but it's, it's a need more broadly of the state um, and the ability to sustain the labor force that we need to function. A lot of times people say, oh, tech, tech workers, you know, they, they, they make so much money, they'll come in and they'll, you know, do, they're not going to be the ones at the supermarket. And the reality is that when they start out, they don't even make enough to live uh, where they work. And so it's a real challenge. It reaches across um, lots of different types of employment, but the, our stability as a region, as a community really demands that we respond. And this is just a symptom. The labor shortage is, is, is a symptom of the challenges um, that we're facing with, with housing in the region. Thanks. And I'll, I'll chime in really fast. Okay, okay. Just going a little bit low tech. And I went to the Sprouts that is right near me here. And I, I let them know that the below market rate program here in Cupertino is actually accepting uh, applications only in the month of October. So I think that that's one of the things that we forget about that we as individuals are able to, when we have the information, which let me emphasize again, the below market rate program is taking applications for both rentals and housing. And so, yes, let's connect with all of the businesses in Cupertino and make sure that they understand that that's something that they can actually get an extra point for working in Cupertino. 
you know, things that can help them to have a possibility of actually getting into the lottery. Awesome. Thank you. We're going to have to stop there. Unfortunately, there's so much more to learn from the six of you. Thank you all so much. If everyone can join me in maybe making a reaction uh, of thanks to our incredible panelists, Mayor Nadia, Abdullah, Bianca, Matthew, and Assemblymember Lowe, thank you so much for sharing your time with us this evening. So we're going to return to actually slightly different breakout groups in a moment. Um, and we'd like you to consider the following questions. The first one is, what questions do you still have? Because you probably still have questions, because I still have questions. What are we going to do with what we learned and discussed tonight? And we're also going to ask everyone to make some sort of commitment to what they're going to do with what they learned. And here is some things that you might be